kind of the start of two lectures. There's like over a hundred slides here, so I'm not going to get that done in one day, nor do I want to try. Uh, plus a few videos in there in different places. So we're trying something a little different today uh, so that we can yeah, go from there. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, this is the advanced nutrition one, is what I'd kind of call today. Uh, this is kind of one of those things that you got to go over. Most of you have probably taken a high school uh, nutrition class. You might have taken a college nutrition class. Uh, the bad news is there's not a whole lot of new information in a college nutrition class, or a college like general class, or a general health class is probably a better way to put it. So this one we're going to go into most of the details about nutrition uh, and then how body composition is done and then obesity and why that's such a big deal in our country. Hopefully your health teacher has gone over that, which I'm assuming he does. Uh, we're going to go over water and electrolytes. Uh, that's another one that we don't go for, doesn't usually happen in a health class. And then all the ways we assess body composition, which we pretty much have an entire class about assessing body composition called fitness assessment, which all of you exercise science majors should be taking next quarter. Oh, side note, uh, I am open to taking time for appointments to get your classes for the next two quarters. Spring? Good? Uh, I don't know if it's a thousand percent locked in. It's still the pool questions. Yeah, it's not well, but next quarter you can have all set up. We can't quite get all the spring uh, pool classes, but other than that, text me, email me, set up a time uh, so that we can get all your classes scheduled quickly. All right, so there's some different classifications of nutrients. You'll have your like micronutrients is what they're called. These are the things we need in small quantities. It'd be your vitamins, your minerals, your salts. Uh, then you have your bigger stuff, your macronutrients that you need large amounts of in order to keep your body going. Water and then the three carbs, proteins, and fats. So your recommended nutrition, macronutrient balance is 55 to 60% carbs. 10 to 15% protein and 35%, preferably less than 35% in fats. The problem is most people swap the carbs and the fats. If you go to my favorite restaurant of the day, which is In-N-Out, I don't know why that sounds so good right now. It's just what's on the brain. I was talking about it in coaching class. Uh, yeah, the amount of fats you get there are much higher than the carbs you get, even though there's still a ton of carbs there. So the numbers you need to know, carbohydrate and protein intake is based on grams per kilogram of body weight to support the training goals. So that's why you need to know the number of, or the kilogram weight of your athlete or your client in order to know what kind of recommendations they need to make. So the protein intake that they recommend in here is 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of your athlete. Your carbs would be 3 to 12 grams. Now those 12 grams of carbs per kilogram, that would be for your Michael Phelps's, your marathon, your Olympic level athletes there. So most people are going to generally be a little lower on the carb side uh, rather than the high side of that. So your RDA is your recommended daily allowance. Uh, it hasn't been used in a while, uh, but you might once in a while hear somebody talk about that, so just know that it exists. Uh, they kind of had the safe dietary intakes there. They do more currently is the dietary recommended intake. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? RDA has always been bad. The foods in public school cafeterias didn't make the RDA um, allowances. So when they would feed children, if they weren't making that number, that's probably bad. Uh, the RDA was actually doubled uh, for schools. Uh, so the sugar and sodium was doubled in school in recommended numbers 
so that they could serve the food in school that kids would actually eat. Uh, so that's why we don't really like the RDA very much. Uh, now, the dietary recommended intakes are still influenced from the original doubling of sugar and uh, sodium intakes. So basically take the recommended uh, sugar and sodium intakes as with a grain of salt anytime you see what the recommended number is. As you know that you know in the 80s, 60s to 80s there, they doubled it so they could allow kids to eat it in school because parents were complaining, well, the RDA says this or you know, that kind of thing, which we had kind of the same thing with COVID. You know, parents got all up in our, well, the COVID regulations from the WDC say this. So uh, it was the same concept there with school lunches at one point. Um, it's better for you to figure out your own uh, nutritional analysis that you need or for your athletes or your clients. A couple more things on the D, on the dietary reference there. So say there used to be the RDA that worked for about 97% of people. Um, those were used to be the best thing you could get. You have your adequate intakes. You'll see that every once in a while there. Uh, you'll see chronic disc risk reduction intake. Um, every once in a while you'll see that. Those are the things that you really shouldn't be eating. And I think I have some more stuff on that in a little bit. And then you have your tolerable, which is like the highest amount you should have in the short term without any toxicity. Did you know you can actually um, overdose on water? So that's where you would see this upper intake level is like you, if someone's drinking gallons and gallons and gallons a day, uh, their body can't keep up with all the intake and can't get it out fast enough doesn't usually happen. Uh, my college health class, we had a behavioral, how did they call it? It's like behavioral change that you had to do. And they had like six options. And one of them was drinking water. And I was like, I'll do that. Uh, so I tried to drink X number of ounces, uh, which I think was uh, half the number of ounces to your body weight. So I at the time was about 200 pounds, so I was trying to drink 100 ounces of water. I had one of those old Nalgene bottles, uh, so I was trying to drink four of those a day, which was about 120. And all I remember is having to use the bathroom all the time when I was trying to drink the recommended amount of water. Uh, but lo and behold, later I figured out that when I get dehydrated, I get migraines, so I have to drink more water than I thought I did at that point. Yeah, so here's where they were saying that uh, the EAR only covers about the lower half. The RDA at least goes to X number of standard deviations, is what they were saying on this one. Some other guidelines here. Uh, these came out in 2020, so they actually came out right before we all went inside. So for over 19-year-olds, you need to have, and there's pretty much the same numbers we had there, uh, good dietary advice is to keep your saturated fats down, your sugar added sugars down, so like things that are like fructose, sucrose in fruits that are like naturally in the food you're eating, but keeping the external stuff out, like adding sugar, like sugary drinks. Uh, one reason I started getting into coffee, honestly, is because Missy, when we were dating and engaged, she's like, um, I'm really concerned at how much carbonated soda you drink because there is so much sugar in that. And I'm like, well, at least if I'm drinking coffee, I can control how much sugar is in it by how much cream I put in it. So I tend to go, I, I go in phases. Like at the moment, I'm probably putting more sugar in it. But the moment I go see my aunt in November here at, on break, she's going to tell me, you need to have less sugar in your coffee. And so I'll go on like a streak where I will have less sugar in my coffee. Uh, but that's one reason I tend to do this is that way I can use more natural sugars like just whole milk is all I'll put in my coffee at times. Uh, that way at least I know it's a more natural sugar rather than like a creamer that will never spoil because there's so many preservatives and so much sugar in it. Uh, but you didn't know that. Uh, keeping your sodium down, uh, alcohol keeping that down. Uh, eating a variety of diet of nutrient-dense foods 
As in, don't go to in and out multiple times a week like I want to right now. All right, so we're going to go through, well, are we going to go through all these? Maybe not. Those are the kind of the main ones that you would go through. Again, you've probably seen this in a college health class or a high school health class because I know I've gone over them many times. So when you do look at a label, they will give you a percentage of total caloric intake. So this would be the daily value. This would be based on a 20 calorie diet. Now, if we went on to, uh, there's some websites that I have you do an assessment class that, oh, maybe I have it on here on the next slide. Uh, so they will have your daily value. It's usually set to a 2000 calorie diet. Now a guy who's six foot four, that weighs 250 pounds. I definitely have to have more than 2000 calories or I will not, uh, health will deteriorate. Uh, so uh, pull out your phones and see if that works. I'm just curious what it takes you to. Does it actually take you to something? I don't have any notes here. Uh, put your numbers in there and see what it gives you. How many calories does it say you need per day? <laughs> wow, that's what happens when you're a small, in-shape college student. <laughs> yup. <laughs> Ethan, what's yours? You were the one that had like the almost no body fat. Okay, that's, a, that's kind of what I assumed is most of you are going to be a little higher than 2,000 uh, with exercise especially. But that also tells you what it would be. This would be, I believe, your resting metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. So that sedentary one's going to be if you get less than 5,000 steps a day. Yeah. So let's see, where am I at right now? Whoops, something went wrong. Something's going on with my watch. I'm at 2,000 steps so far today. That's not good. I will probably get about 5,000 steps taking my son for a walk later, so maybe he'll take a nap. So those are giving you some numbers there, just to give you an idea of where we're going with this. So you'll have your basal or your resting metabolic rate. So that's if you laid down all day long, that's how many calories your body would need to survive. So that's like never even getting out of bed and not being sick. If you're sick, you use a little bit more. Uh, your basal metabolic rate. So this is similar, but there's not as strict like uh, laying down in a thermal controlled room, no physical activity for 12 hours. I mean, it can get really strict there. So this would be 60 to 75% of your energy. It's going to be a little lower in women and in both genders, it's going to decline uh, the older you get. So your muscle compositions, you're going to have different. So you have monosaccharides and see polysaccharides are going to have two or two and three. So these are all chemistry. Everybody taking chemistry already, correct? or should be taking it soon if you haven't taken it. Uh, so that's where all these kind of numbers go in there. So different functions of, so this is carbs. Sorry, I missed that detail. We're doing carbs. So they're going to have either mono one, so it's going to take one chemical breakdown. Disaccharides will have two. Polysaccharides will take three. There's those glucose, fructose, galactose. Uh, those are all different types of them. Your different functions, it's the main energy source, as a, we use these with glycogen, and we store those for that 15 to 60 second burst of energy there. And then you also can convert it as well later. Uh, they're also, your brain and spinal cords are swimming in glucose. So we can actually test a person's blood with a glucometer um, and tell if they have a skull fracture or not. So if you have a skull fracture and your blood is higher in glucose, then they'll know that there's actually a fracture inside the skull and it's leaking into the body. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so determinants of your glycogen replacement, carbohydrate intakes, as much as you can eat, uh, the different types of exercise type, your eccentrics are going to create more glycogen synthesis. 
Uh, let's see, we kind of already went over those numbers there. In athletes, hunger is often insufficient. So I'm guessing that Ethan over there probably needs to eat more carbs because he's probably exercising so much. Or are you one of those that can eat like two whole pizzas by yourself? We used to have a guy on the basketball team in college that he we'd go to, uh, I don't know why, Coach loves Subway, and he hated Taco Bell. So, like, no basketball trips did we ever go to Taco Bell, except the one game where Coach drove to the game, and then his wife came and picked him up because he had something else to go to. And so we all drove ourselves back. <laughs> We're like, where are we stopping to eat? And he gave us the credit card. We're like, where are we stopping to eat? And we're like, Taco Bell, because he would never take us. <laughs> Taking 15 basketball guys to Taco Bell and all ordering, it was like trays. <laughs> trays and trays of Taco Bell that they were bringing out to us. Uh, I think we ordered 100 tacos that day for the for 15 guys, and they were all gone. Uh, so yeah, those are state. Uh, insufficient carbo uh, carbohydrate intake will make you feel real heavy. I'm feeling tired more often. Where am I at here on things? 14. A couple more slides. Um, oh man, I don't can't get to it. No. Maybe I'll try to get to it here. I'm not sure if this one's a video or if it even works anymore. Nope, it's not there anymore. Oh, they really do not like my ad blocker. Come on. There we go. Not sure if that video is going to work. Let's see if they'll list it here for us. Oop. So at one point, I had a video from my high school health class where this dude tried to eat the Michael Phelps diet in a day. He, had, he didn't even make it through lunch. <laughs> he was like, nope. Let's see if this actually has it on here. Maybe that was it. Oh, that's it. It's taken a lot of mind training and physical training to get to this point. The Michael Phelps diet challenge. Three fried egg sandwiches with cheese and butter. French toast with powdered sugar. Chocolate chip pancakes. Burnt five egg omelet. Some oatmeal with blueberries. Ham and cheese sandwiches with extra butter. A half kilo of pasta. An extra large pepperoni pizza. Another half kilo of pasta. Energy drinks.
Nothing like washing it down with energy drinks. Man, you'd be so buzzed after that many energy drinks. <laughs> I was like, you can totally be cutting this together, but... It's going to be the recipient of the largest poop in history. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. Maybe even share it with your friends. Into the web. The link is in the description below. You can vote. I think that's actually the one I had that I would use in my classes. I'm just going to hit play on this so I can save it for later. Four cups of oatmeal with blueberries. Three. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, you can go a little overboard, but I mean, if you're training for eight hours a day, probably, I mean, he pretty much wakes up, eats, trains, eats, trains, eats, trains, and goes back to sleep. But I mean, when you're doing that much swimming, then yeah, I can get that. No, definitely not. Definitely not. So where that kind of goes to and where that applies here is a your muscle glycogen as you're training. So in between training bouts here, so training bouts of two hours, your high carbohydrate diet, and here's your low carbohydrate diet. So as you keep training, so the influence of carbohydrates on glycogen stores during repeated days of training. So if you every 12 hour or every 24 hours you're training for two hours at a time, you can see how these blood glycogens keep going further and further down. And always trying to get back to that normal that it was at in the first place. So the red falls down quicker and also can't get back up. And here would be your time to exhaustion and your initial muscle glycogen. So the only one we can really see here is the high carb diet here, a normal diet and a low carb diet. You're going to exhaust yourself a lot quicker uh, depending on what your diet is. All right, so some classifications here to go with that. So your glycolic index is how much glycogen is in the thing there. So high glycolic index is going to be like sports drinks, uh, jelly beans. Have I seen the jelly belly plane? that's up there there's a biplane that's stored in one of the hangars up there that they pull it out every once in a while and it actually has like jelly belly on it so it's like the jelly belly plane I've only seen it like two or three times uh, in a year uh, so baked fried potatoes cornflakes pretzels those are ones that are gonna have lots of carbs and lots of glycolic index uh, also if for uh, diabetes are these the things you avoid So if you have a client that's got diabetes, that's those are the things you do not want. They do not want to eat. Uh, so your moderate ones are going to be pastries, pitas, breads, and stuff. Your lower glycolic are still going to have a lot in there, but they're just lower than others. It is, but the um, it's better than these. Uh, so do you carry like any extra? Foods with you at all times. That's what my mom has too. She keeps um, tablets in her purse all the time. Uh, what about the uh, if you get too high? What you... Uh, I got one, so... Oh, you got it all automated. <laughs> Okay. Okay. See, I, I had on a note on here that some people carry like a peanut butter sand or a peanut butter sandwich or a candy bar um, around as well. So I'll say glycolic index isn't perfect. Uh, it just kind of gives you an idea. So fat plus high 
glycogen could equal a lower one. So these calculations depend on what kind of food you're having. So if you have like whole wheat bread compared to white bread, it's going to make a different change there and the different load there. And there are some calculations that you can do to go along with that. So some higher carbohydrate factors uh, that increase your exercise time is if you have neuroglycemia or low uh, glycolic index for a pre-game pre snack or a pre-workout snack. Uh, I used to have a buddy that would give me, he was all into, uh, I think it's Amway was the company, but he, would, he gave me all of these uh, sport drink things to put into a water bottle. And he's like, here's the one you take before and here's the one you take after. And when I was reading what they were, I was like, huh, carbs in a juice basically is what it was. And I'm like, this is just making this into a sports drink. Okay, whatever. I just used them all up. Uh, remember doing that in Mississippi on an exercise bike in my living room, which I had to move once the toddler started moving because it went from baby to moving. All of a sudden I had to put it in a different room. Uh, some carbohydrates that will lower your inc uh, your exercise time is having a very high glycolic pre-exercise uh, snacks and you'll feel heavy and sleepy and you're just going to stop short of wherever you think you should be. If you don't carbohydrate load in any ways and if you don't eat during exercise, especially longer things, eating wins races. Uh, that's something I've heard from a, a person I follow on Instagram there. And here's where that all kind of goes with your muscle glycogen index, depending on how long you're exercising. And same concept here. One more slide and we'll take a break. So pre-exercise sugar and then exercise goes down and then working your way back up. And then no sugar in comparison there. So this would be your blood. So they were actually taking blood glue or blood samples throughout the exercise. Is how they would get all this. This was completed at a full 90 minutes at 70% of their VO2 max. Uh, the sugar feeding trial only made it to 75 minutes. So just interesting that they couldn't even finish the test. So unlike pre-exercise carbohydrates, it doesn't treat, trigger hypoglycemia. So this, uh, that would be improving muscle permeability to glucose, insulin binding sites altered. Those are things they're still testing to figure out. It'd be interesting if that changes in the next textbook here. Uh, so your carbohydrate intake after essential exercises, uh, it's going to be resynthesis is going to be really high for two hours. Take a standing break. I forgot to put them in. So Noah, did you like the first half or the second half of the game better? What? Weren't you at the basketball game last night? Oh, yeah. uh, I like the first 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, if we didn't lose our big man, we'd be so good. We're already good. It's just, you know. We lost a big man? Yeah, we had like two. We had one guy who yeah, the O. Yeah. I remember talking to a couple of guys that I don't yeah, see they anymore. And we couldn't figure out how to break a zone. They put that one through one zone. Yep, they just couldn't figure out how to get get past that first line of defense there. Mm -hmm. Yep, they had some new actions. I saw them working on in practice. Like, yes. They didn't make a ton of mistakes. Uh, I was sitting next to the coach's sibling, like the head coach. Like they're like, yeah, that's my my brother's the head coach, and so I was sitting next to their family, and there's a. No, they're they our opposing team. Yeah, because I was trying to figure out what the end on their jerseys was. All right, let's keep going. I was trying to, a couple people left there, but we'll keep rolling. All right, going through these a little quicker here. So most of this should be pretty normal that we've gone through. So you have fat acids are essentials for your body to function. Uh, your total fat should be less than 35%. Definitely keep those saturated fats way down and your cholesterol stuff way down. Your free fatty acids are important during exercise. 
Uh, so those are going to delay your exhaustion uh, as things are getting depleted. So high fat versus high carbohydrates. High fat intakes is going to have more circulating good free fatty acids, um, but it's also going to lower your glycogen storage. Uh, let's see, I had an interesting note here. So it's not going to help you with like basketball and volleyball, eating a high fat diet. Though, uh, one of the things I researched earlier is that Alzheimer's could be considered a third, this is just a possibility, they're not sure. Alzheimer's could be a third type of diabetes and possibly a high fat, low carb diet seems to delay the Alzheimer's symptoms. Which means a lot to me since I lost my uncle about this time last year to Alzheimer's. And so I was like, huh. So when I saw that, I had to check on it. So I'm going to keep an eye on that as time goes on here to see if they come up with any more um, options there. So protein is not a primary energy source. It is actually more of a recovery thing. It is essential for your body to function. So growth, repair, maintenance, that's why we say eat a lot of protein when you're working out a lot because you want your muscles to recover from it. There are 20 essential amino acids and you need to have those, um, those have to be consumed uh, to be able to have that happen. So here are the essential ones that you need to have and here are the non-essential ones. Uh, so this one in children is not synthesized in young infants or children, but it is essential for children, for them, let's see, it is an essential amino acid for children, but not for adults. So we already kind of went over the numbers there. Expensive protein intake can have some health risks. Uh, carbohydrates and protein after is good for your muscle recovery. Uh, so the excessive protein risks are going to have kidney problems is what could happen from that. So some vitamins, got to go through these quickly. Small but essential or organic molecules that you need there. They're usually, a vitamin is generally fat soluble. There are some exceptions, but generally they're fat soluble. Uh, and they also then you could actually OD on them. Uh, because they are fat soluble anything that's water soluble you'll just excrete it out um, always a good one I like to mention there is like vitamin C you've seen those things that are like don't get sick drink eat these vitamin C tablets all you're doing is having expensive excretions because anything you don't use just goes right through so does it help yeah. but it's not like you're it's going to keep you from getting sick by eating these 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C, you're not going to use those. Uh, vitamin K, uh, if you drink, have like too much of that, it's going to cause your blood to thicken. Um, vitamin D is one that we need mostly when it comes to vitamins. And vitamin D comes from? So if you live in areas like the Pacific Northwest where it's um, cloudy 250 days a year, Sometimes they need things like a vitamin D lamp in their rooms or in their living rooms so that they can keep their vitamin D up. Uh, let's see, vitamin B complex there, uh, going to help with uh, ATP production. And so there's that acetylcholines and things. Vitamin C is also good for collagen maintenance iron absorption. So ladies uh, that have iron deficiencies, my wife is one of them. Uh, so her doctor actually said that she needs to have more vitamin C so that she can um, keep having iron. Uh, so basically her body will absorb more iron is what she does. Otherwise, she has to take like straight iron tablets sometimes. Uh, so minerals, calcium is good for your bones. Phosphorus is also good for your bones. All right, some other ones here, you have iron. Uh, so that one's if you have deficiency, uh, deficiency, so they'll say you have anemia, so not enough iron in your blood so that you're, it's not going to transport enough things around your body. Um, and you can have too much iron. That gets bad. Uh, women seem to get anemia easier than men. Uh, sodium, potassium, and chloride, those are all needed, uh, but excessive is dangerous. That's actually what a lethal injection is. Uh, would be sodium chloride. So like when they have to kill somebody that's done something bad, uh, the lethal injection is sodium chloride. 
So you do need those as a part of your body, but in excess, it can kill you. So water and electrolyte balances. Uh, so 50 to 60 of your percent of your body weight is in water. That's why when people are trying to cut right before a weigh-in or something, they try to like limit their water intake so they're purposely dehydrated so they can make weight. Uh, that would be like for boxing, UFCs, uh, and then your wrestling kit. Uh, so like if you're a wrestling coach, be really careful of your uh, your athletes and their weight intake and water intakes because they're going to try to keep in their weight class and they, some, some players go a little overboard there and you can get eating disorders and stuff from that. Uh, but yeah, so your body weight there, uh, one to six percent is going to be weight loss of sweat is common in athletes. So if you play an entire basketball game, you could lose six percent of your weight. Boy, that would be nice. Probably can't do that for me anymore. Uh, so, but losing six to twelve percent is possibly fatal. So, like, you can lose too much weight uh, from water. So, two thirds of the water is inside your cells and one third out. So, it's going to be transporting things, getting that stuff out of your body, uh, temperature regulation, sweating, that's the one we probably think of the most, and then blood pressure maintenance. So water is a good thing. Blood plasma is basically water with electrolytes. That's what it has a note here. So you can gain water at rest, uh, 33 milligrams a day, so about 60% from drink, 30% from your food, and 10% from respiration in your cells. Uh, you will lose a little bit of water at rest, so evaporation from the skin, excretion from the kidneys, uh, large intestines will have a little bit there, and some more sweat at the end there. So evaporation from skin through breathing out. Uh, definitely easy to dehydrate. Uh, water loss um, is greater than the water gain. Usually when it's hot outside and dry like it is here most of the year, uh, those environmental factors, I say we go over those a lot, so you should all be fairly familiar. There's kind of the numbers that you could have there, percentage of total and percentage once you start exercising. And that's more of the same. Let's see how far we can get here to make it easier to, on tomorrow's. So as you lose water and electrolytes, uh, you can start to uh, get worse in your athletic performance. So as your temperature goes up, sweat goes up, performance tends to go down. Uh, I've definitely thought it looked like some of our basketball players at the end of the game uh, were having a hard time. They were front rimming their jump shots in the second half. And my wife's next to me goes, she's like, I know we're only four minutes into this half, but they're playing tired. And I kind of turned around and was like, they might not be hydrating enough. So probably our basketball team needs to hydrate a little better at halftime. Uh, so the other things is your plasma volume goes down, so that makes your heart function harder and temperature regulation. Uh, the effects of dehydration on anaerobic and strength performance is a little more unclear. So you lose electrolytes in sweat, so that's going to be mostly sodium and Potassium chloride, sodium chloride, uh, and so that's why most of your electrolyte drinks, sports drinks, Gatorades, all have those have sodium in them uh, to try to take away all and to replace all those electrolytes. And electrolyte really just means sodium, potassium, vitamins, minerals that your body's using. Uh, let's see, most you're going to lose a lot of electrolytes in your excretions. And there's kind of the numbers of where that's going. So your thirst, you're going to have several different types of thirst here. So you're going to have your osmoreceptors. This would be your blood is asking for it. Your baroreceptors is there's not enough blood total. Thirst is really not well calibrated. So when you think you're thirsty, you probably already were thirsty or you're already dehydrated. Like if you actually get to that point in your exercise, you probably are already dehydrated if you're like, wow, I'm thirsty. Uh, you should have been doing that. Uh, my coaches or my assistant coaches over uh, at prep are having to keep reminding me because I tend to get kind of focused on one thing to make sure to let them get a drink. Uh, and today I've practiced at PUCE 
And I have no idea if they even have drinking fountains over there. So I'm a little bit concerned. I'm like, I was like, I don't know. Is it in the wall there? I hope it doesn't stick out and they can like run into it. That would be bad. It's going to be an interesting practice. I know that much. It's better than uh, nothing because I got a game on Thursday apparently. Seven practices and a scrimmage. Seriously? That is not enough time for a new team. Uh, anyways, so heart rate with no fluids, heart rate with saline, so that'd be like a sport drink with salt in it, and then just water. So notice how water keeps the heart rate lower than even a sport drink and then no fluids. So this would have been done on a heart rate of a six-hour treadmill running. I was like, you guys think the VO2 max test is tough. Six-hour exercise. Yeah, my goodness. Man, you've got six hours. Man, you could watch like three Star Wars movies there. Watch a whole trilogy. Let's make sure it's the originals, not the new ones. Oh. The new ones are okay. They're just not as good as the originals. Then you got me. I grew up with the prequels. I was like 12 years old when the first one came out. So I was like, oh, those are good days. Oh, who am I, how am I doing on numbers here? Oof. So uh, hyponatremios, this would be too much sodium in your body there. Uh, excessive, uh, oh, sorry, not enough sodium. Uh, so you need to have lots of rehydration. Ultra marathoners are the ones that are going to have that. So it takes a lot to get to that point. Uh, so it's just knowing that it does exist. So if somebody's been exercising a bunch and all of a sudden they're bloating, puffy, uh, I'd probably be looking at worse things than, or at like other heat related issues before I would probably think about this. But I mean, you could have a, a cerebral edema, uh, swelling in the brain, cognitive dysfunction. So you could go to coma and die from this. So it doesn't happen often, but just know that it does exist. So the best thing to do is actually to prehydrate before a game or before a bout of exercise. So a couple hours before, drink 200 to 600 mils of liquid. Uh, during, you want to stay within 2% of your pre-exercise weight. So you don't want to overdrink, but you do want to keep hydrating consistently. Uh, so after, then you want to replace all your stuff. That's where that salty snack afterwards is good without going too far there. Yeah, we're going to end on that. We'll call it a day. I was like, it's 11.59 according to my thing there. Have a wonderful day. We will do more of this tomorrow.